The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, this is Tammy Foley. I want to make sure that um, you can hear. Um, Chanel, can you let me know since you're on if you can hear? Chanel? Hello? I need, and if anybody can let me know if they can hear. I know. Chanel, can you let me know if you can hear? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. We're just making sure this is, uh, we thought we were having technical uh, challenges here. So thank you. I see that everybody can hear us. Great. Um, we want to welcome you today. We are here with Deb Covington, Carla Monroe, and Brad Horn to talk about HIPAA. And we'll get started in our broadcast. And I want to make sure that we have this recording in just one moment. And hold on. Just one second, apologize for the delay here. When they change the screen, yes, so it's in progress, Carla. So whoever's going to get started. Okay, we're going to turn it over to Brad to begin with. Okay, let me go over there. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So I was asked to kind of give you a quick rundown of how do I make a screen move? Do that. I did that. Oh, look, it moves. OK. We were asked to give you uh, simply a, a quick overview of some of the basic HIPAA requirements. So I'm going to do the, the introduction here of just kind of the basics that we deal with on a daily basis. And that'll be followed by Carl and Deb, who will go into a little bit more of what compliance really means uh, that we deal with, again, on a daily basis. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, why do we, we have HIPAA? Uh, HIPAA came about from a 1996 law. Uh, and prior to HIPAA, there were no federal laws in place regarding the exchange of healthcare information. And that was significant in a couple of different ways. Um, there, was, there was nothing that really occurred when bad things happened with healthcare information. And there were a number of big national stories uh, going on in the early to mid 90s of uh, things that were happening, such as providers who were selling healthcare information. A big story of uh, an OBGYN who sold birth records to Fisher Price. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was important that, uh, that the federal government stepped in and did a few things. Uh, privacy wasn't all that was at issue in 96 when HIPAA came about. The biggest issue that they were addressing was uh, there were no established standards for healthcare providers to communicate with healthcare plans. Uh, so back then there were 400 plus data standards that different, uh, different uh, healthcare plans required providers to deal with, uh, and and that meant that it was very difficult to just exchange data to try to get paid, and and that was a big impetus for the law. Uh, and 
it, the privacy aspect of, of HIPAA kind of came along as, as a secondary issue. Some interest groups stepped in and said, look, if federal government is going to regulate these data exchanges, we also want you to address privacy as well to make sure that those data exchanges are secure. Uh, so HIPAA came about again from uh, 96. So Clinton signed it into law in, in August of 96. The, the law required the secretary of HHS to put in place administrative regulations uh, because the law was very, as most laws are, that come out of Congress, very vague, just the high level. And so our first set of regulations came out of HHS in 2003. Uh, and they, they come in kind of three flavors. Uh, there's the privacy rule, the security rule, and the enforcement rule. And so we'll talk about all those uh, here in a bit. Uh, the regulations have changed over time. There was a big revamp of the regulations that strengthened them and required a lot of new compliance obligations and strengthened enforcement from a civil fine perspective and a, and a, a criminal sanction perspective. Uh, and those came about 10 years later in uh, 2013. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting when you think about HIPAA today, you know, the, the kind of impetus for this law was to kind of correct the, the data exchange issues that providers were having. Uh, that was done over the years. And so you hardly ever hear of concerns about data exchanges anymore. Now what you hear about are breaches of patient information all related to HIPAA. So the, the HIPAA statute is actually found in mostly uh, 42 U.S.C. section 1320D of the uh, U.S. Code. Uh, you generally don't need to turn to the U.S. Code too much. Kind of where the rubber hits the road in HIPAA are the regulations that were put in place in 2003 and then updated again in, in 2013. Uh, and they're in three different areas of the Code of Federal Regulations, 45 CFR Part 160, which includes a lot of definitions that are necessary really to understand the other regulations. Uh, and there's also sections in 160 that outline a, a number of administrative issues, such as, uh, you know, if you're being fined under HIPAA, you know, how you address that, how you seek judicial relief from that. Um, 45 CFR 162. That's where you find the transaction standards that were originally put in place. Uh, national provider identifier was something that came along the way. And so now uh, whenever a provider submits a claim, they have to include their NPI number in with the claim. And so you find all the details of that in 162. And then part 164 is where you find the security, privacy, and, and other obligations such as patient notice. Uh, and again, that patient notice issue that came about in 2013. So when we talk about HIPAA, first thing to realize is HIPAA is somewhat focused. It doesn't uh, protect all information, doesn't protect all healthcare information. Uh, it, it first it only applies to entities that are either covered entities or business associates. And covered entities under the statute are limited to three categories of entities. Uh, so kind of from right to left, uh, healthcare clearinghouses are covered. You, you don't deal much with healthcare clearinghouses. Those are kind of the middlemen between providers and like hospitals and uh, big payers such as Wellmark and the like. Uh, and they normalize the data for those entities to make sure that it's, it's meeting the standards. Healthcare plans. So again, uh, uh, HMOs, health insurance companies like a Wellmark, um, Medicaid, uh, would fit into the category of a health plan as well as our uh, state chip program called Hawkeye. And then healthcare providers. So generally most healthcare providers have to comply with HIPAA, but uh, there's kind of an important exception on the, the lower left of that slide. Um, it only applies to healthcare providers to the extent that those providers are transmitting information in electronic format in connection with a transaction that's regulated by HIPAA. Uh, and it's an odd exception. You might think that, well, why isn't all healthcare information protected whenever you're dealing with a covered entity, uh, including all the providers that you go to? And the, the answer is, well, this is a federal law and Congress has to have a constitutional basis for putting in place a law. And they justified HIPAA on the Commerce Clause uh, provision of the U.S. Constitution. 
And the Commerce Clause allows Congress to regulate uh, interstate commerce or, or things that go between the states. And uh, so their justification for HIPAA was, well, all of this electronic data, the ones and zeros that make up all this healthcare information, that stuff goes across state lines. And so we can regulate that. And so that was kind of the foundation. So a healthcare provider that does nothing other than keep paper copies of, of records, doesn't fax things to anybody, doesn't submit electronic claims, that provider, in theory, uh, can avoid HIPAA compliance. Uh, I think in today's world, that's really hard for a provider to do. But when HIPAA first came about and those regulations went in place, we had a, a ton of providers in Iowa saying, we don't want to deal with this. So we're going to stick with our paper processes. So just remember those kind of key exceptions to applicability of HIPAA. Uh, HIPAA also applies to business associates. And uh, the way that this came about, uh, the first draft of the regulations that were put in place in 2003 just spoke to covered entities. There was no reference to business associates. And a lot of people wrote in and complained that, look, that doesn't make any sense because a covered entity like a hospital is going to contract with you know people to do their accounting work and contracting with a number of other organizations where they'll have to convey this protected information out. And so it's improper for the, your data to lose its protection just because it goes to another entity like that that's not technically a covered entity. Uh, so the, the final draft of the regulations came out with this concept of a business associate, and that's just some person or uh, organization that's under contract to do some business function for a covered entity. So that might be accounting, fraud detection, billing, anything like that where protected health information has to be accessed by, the, by this uh, other entity. That entity has to be designated as a business associate. And the obligations there are that uh, the covered entity has to put what's called a business associate agreement or a BAA in the arrangement. So it's gotta be written down in the contract. And the business associate thereby is, is obligated to do the same things that the covered entity would have to do in relation to HIPAA and protect that patient information. Uh, it's also important to note that just because someone doesn't put that necessary BAA language in a contract, it doesn't mean that HIPAA doesn't apply. Uh, in part of the, the updates to the regulations in 2013, uh, CMS made most of the HIPAA regulations directly applicable to covered entities and business associates. So just because you don't have a business associate agreement in a contract somewhere doesn't mean that it doesn't apply. And then HIPAA protects protected health information, or what we always call PHI. And there's the regulatory side to it. And for information to be uh, covered by HIPAA as PHI, it has to be, one, individually identifiable. And that means that it relates in some ways to a person's receipt of health care. It might be uh, a health care bill, an explanation of benefits. It could be, uh, in the, the feds would look at it as extending to, uh, say, someone had a, a Medicare card that had Medicare and the person's name on it and their identifying number that's enough for HIPAA protection. So if that card went to the wrong party, then the feds would say that, uh, that that's a breach of the HIPAA regulations. Uh, important to note that the, the concept of PHI extends to data in any form, although HIPAA was written with the idea that it was really about this exchange of electronic information. Uh, today, HIPAA applies to paper documents or telephone calls or texts or uh, any kind of information that would be designated as individually identifiable and related to the receipt of, of health care. That's, that's PHI. Uh, and to be protected under the HIPAA regulations, that data has to be held by a covered entity or a business associate. So if, uh, if I were to take my health care information and put it into a safety, de safety deposit box in a bank, well, it's no longer protected by HIPAA at all uh, because it's not being held by a business associate or covered entity. Uh, so important exceptions there. And there are a number of other exceptions to, to HIPAA and, and 
uh, all of the kind of designations of things as PHI or not. Uh, so when you ever go down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out is this PHI or not, it's, it's important to touch base with folks who are in the know, such as Deb and Carla, who can help you work through that. HIPAA uh, also is, uh, it regulates the use or disclosure of healthcare information. And understand that it's not just sending data outside of your organization uh, that is uh, triggering HIPAA obligations. It's, it's internal use as well. So that means anytime you're accessing it, analyzing it, utilizing it, it anything related to your use of the data uh, has some HIPAA strings that you need to be careful of. Uh, for instance, there are a number of stories that you've probably seen on the news about, you know, a, a nosy nurse who in a hospital who opened up the, the electronic systems to look and see what Tom Cruise was being treated for in the hospital. That's a violation of HIPAA uh, and typically results in people being fired. So uh, and, and that's not a not a disclosure outside of the organization. It's just an improper use. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about um, any kind of how you're using data in your organization, how you're obtaining it, storing it, and then allowing access to it, because all of that is regulated by HIPAA. Also know that HIPAA, as important and sometimes scary as it is, it, it, we consider it a floor of protection, but not a ceiling. State laws and there are other federal laws uh, generally are not preempted when you when you think about HIPAA. So if any state law or other federal law is more stringent in its requirements than HIPAA, then you have to comply with HIPAA and the other laws as well. Uh, we have, even our folks sometimes make serious mistakes when they say, well, we're complying with HIPAA, we put a BAA in the contract, so we're fine. No, you really have to think through whether you're dealing with the more significant uh, mental health records, substance abuse records, HIV AIDS, uh, diagnosis or genetic information, all of that has heightened uh, protections that apply. And so we have to be more careful with those categories. And there are also times when state laws intervene and, and some of these apply to health records or, or not. So in other words, uh, Iowa Code Chapter 715C applies to any kind of personal information, not personal health information. Uh, that can be used to basically harm someone in a financial way. So if you happen to post on the web a series of social, secu social security numbers, uh, that would be a violation of 715C uh, and, and not a breach of HIPAA. And Iowa Code 21730 for DHS, that applies to uh, all of our programs. So anyone who's a beneficiary of a DHS program uh, so it may be food stamps, TANF, uh, FIP, you know, wh whatever. Um, uh, all of those uh, individuals, their personal information, again, uh, is, is protected by those laws. And so that sits on top of HIPAA. There are a ton of exceptions to, the, to HIPAA as well. Uh, one of the key ones is employment records. And for the most part, if you have healthcare information, but it's sitting in your employment records, generally it's not protected by HIPAA. Uh, and and it may seem like an odd exception, but, but it's true. And it would be true even for a hospital uh, who has a series of nurses and maybe it's, you know, nurse vaccination records that are held in the employment records. Those would not technically be uh, protected by HIPAA. They're protected by the employment record standards. Uh, FERPA is another big exception to HIPAA. So you have a lot of uh, uh, facilities, school facilities that fall under the, and I forget what FERPA stands for, Federal Educational Records Privacy Act, yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but FERPA and HIPAA can be applied either together or individually by an educational institution. So you'll find a lot of schools that even though they have nursing facilities, they say, you know what, we're not dealing with, with HIPAA, we're going to deal with FERPA. Uh, and again, information that's not held by a business associate or a covered entity, that's not protected by HIPAA. Uh, information that isn't in any way related to healthcare. So again, for a DHS program, uh, 
like a, a food stamps. Uh, food stamps is not going to be covered by HIPAA because it doesn't in any way relate to healthcare. But for DHS generally, we uh, we are always going to be covered by HIPAA because we run the Medicaid program, we have the Hawkeye program, we have a lot of very sensitive data. So almost all parts of DHS has to comply with with HIPAA. When you delve off into the the last set of regulations, uh, the Part 164 regulations put in place again all the way back to 2003. Uh, there are kind of subcategories of what you need to do to comply with HIPAA. There are administrative requirements, technical requirements, and phys physical safeguards. And when we look at these and when we listen to what uh, HHS has to say about, you know, the compliance obligations, it really is all kicked off by that first bullet point there, the risk assessment. Uh, risk assessment is a process of looking at your organization and looking at how data enters the organization, how it's used internally, how you store it, uh, how you disclose it, and ultimately how you destroy it. Uh, and all of the other obligations that uh, arise in this, off of this slide, the workforce sanctions, the system monitoring, security office, everything else is triggered off of that risk assessment. Because what an organization is supposed to do is, is do a very comprehensive look at all of those issues, figure out uh, where the risks lie, and then put in place appropriate safeguards to make sure that all of the risks are addressed. And that means having sanction authority over your workforce if they were to violate HIPAA, uh, system monitors, uh, make sure you have a security officer as a core obligation, uh, you have to train your workforce. From a technical perspective, you have to have appropriate policies and procedures, and that can cover a ton of different areas. For instance, if uh, your workforce is taking PHI out in their vehicles, you know, you need to have appropriate policies and procedures of how to s store that information when it's, you know, parked in a car. So maybe that is put into a lock trunk only or, or the like. Uh, but policies and procedures can be quite comprehensive, quite long. And uh, other issues like automatic logging off of your computers, uh, encryption. Uh, when the last time I, I went to a, a, a HIPAA civil rights um, presentation, the, the, the feds, they said their, their key to compliance with HIPAA was, was three things, encryption, encryption, encryption. Making sure that all the data that you have is, is fully shielded from disclosure, even if you were to lose a laptop, as long as the laptop is encrypted, then you're probably not dealing with sanctions under HIPAA. Uh, it's probably just a training issue. And that kind of goes along with the, the last category there, physical safeguards as well, making sure that your, your information is, is behind lock and key, uh, fully encrypted whenever possible. Other obligations uh, from a privacy rule perspective, again, uh, kind of mentioned the controlling use or disclosure consistent with regulations. Uh, the, the, the key thing that we always say is, look, if no clear exception applies, it allows you to use or disclose the information, get the patient authorization, uh, an individual patient authorization before you use or disclose. And that way you can always be certain you're doing what the patient wants with their information. From, from our perspective, like running the, the Medicaid program, uh, there are some of the, the core uh, exceptions that, that we see, we use every day. Uh, the ones that we point to are using data for purposes of payment, treatment, or healthcare operations, or PTHO. Uh, so, so whenever data is being exchanged internally, we know that we're fairly safe from a Medicaid perspective because we're normally either trying to treat the patient or uh, run the organization or pay claims. Those all fit within those kind of core exceptions. Uh, there's also an exception in HIPAA that allows an organization to comply with its legal obligations. So if you are required by law to do something with patient information, HIPAA will stand aside and let you do that. So if a judge has sent you an order saying you shall turn over this information, you know, by Friday, 
<laughs> we get those <laughs> orders every now and again. Uh, you are allowed to do so uh, and, and still comply with the HIPAA obligations. HIPAA will just stand aside. And there are other exceptions as well. Uh, even though patient information is protected, you're still in, under certain circumstances allowed to use some of that information to notify law enforcement. If you've got a shooting victim in your hospital, that's there. There's an exception that would apply that would allow you to, to let law enforcement know. Uh, generally speaking, whenever you're using or disclosing healthcare information, uh, the HIPAA regs say only use or disclose the minimum necessary. So. Uh, you know, if you if you have a database of information and you have contractors that need to look at certain pieces of that information to do their job uh, under HIPAA, what you should really do is just limit that contractor down to the data elements that they need. Kind of an, an example of how that works is historically Medicaid had uh, mainframe database screens that they could look at to to help people work through claims issues. Um, and historically, that screen used to display the social security number of, of every patient. Uh, and eventually, they, they realized that wasn't really a good idea and would be better to just shield that from most people unless it's really necessary for, for people to look at that. And so they've, they've taken those social security numbers off the screens because they didn't feel that it met that minimum necessary standard. But other than that, you know, general HIPAA obligations, uh, make sure you have business associate language uh, in contracts uh, when it's appropriate. Uh, organizations like DHS have to have a notice of privacy, patient privacy practices uh, and uh, display that so people know how DHS says that it will use patient information. You have to uh, give patients access to their information, allow them to amend their uh, PHI uh, if and when it's wrong. So uh, a lot going on there. As part of the big change that came about in 2013, HHS escalated the uh, criminal sanctions as well as the civil sanctions um, to, to make sure that people were a little conscientious about how they were using and disclosing information. And uh, basically, if someone is obtaining or disclosing information without authorization, and that, that's a fairly low bar. Uh, you're raising the possibility that uh, you're 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 possibly looking at criminal sanctions for that conduct, uh, and the the sanctions are pretty pretty extreme if someone's acting knowingly and violating HIPAA. Uh, they can be fined fifty thousand dollars and put in jail for a year, and that's federal penitentiary jail. That's real jail. Uh, <laughs> If someone acts with false pretenses, so maybe that's um, uh, a hacker who tries to get into a system to obtain patient information, that's 100 grand and five years in jail. And then if someone acts with the intent to sell, sell uh, have personal gain, or maliciously harm someone, a quarter million dollars and 10 years in jail. So the, the fines have escalated. I forget what the, they, they were originally, but this is a much more than than it was before uh, the um, and we don't see much criminal prosecution in terms of HIPAA but I think that we will in the future uh, the bigger concern for most organizations like DHS and because we know that we're every day trying to make sure that we fully comply with with HIPAA uh, but even organizations that are doing their very best can be subject to really substantial civil monetary penalties so these, again, were escalated in 2013, uh, and, and they begin with, uh, you can start getting fines from the point that you act with willful neglect. And again, that's a really low standard. If, if CMS determines that you, you're just really basically negligent in what you were doing, it's not that they, they can fine you, they, they kind of have to. Uh, and civil monetary penalties go up to one and a half million dollars per year per provision of HIPAA that's violated. And if you look at any breach scenario uh, and look back at the, the slide for just a bit ago when we were talking about the risk assessments, if you do have a, a breach uh, of, of HIPAA, uh, OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, will investigate you and generally they send you a list of 
18, 20, 20, 18. yeah, it's around 20, 20, 20 questions that they'll send you and they'll, they'll want to see, you know, your risk assessments for the past 10 years, all of your policies and procedures. They'll want to know that you've trained your employees properly. They'll want to see proof of training. They'll, uh, they'll want to know what your sanction policy is and how you've used it. They'll want to see uh, all of your policies and procedures around, you know, use and storage and uh, all of that related to data. And if they find that you've, in each one of those those queries that they're they're asking you about is a provision of the HIPAA regulations. And so every one of those provisions of the HIPAA regulations that you violate can give you a penalty of a million and a half dollars per provision per year. So these fines can really be large. I think the largest that we've seen so far under the HIPAA regs is 16 million but they have a number of them that are 5.5 million, 4.8 million. One at the end of the presentation will show you. Um, so this is uh, pretty substantial money and you wanna make sure that you are doing everything to, to be able to prove to the HIPAA investigators later on that you're, you tried your best. And what we hear from the federal overseers is that's really what they're looking for. They don't expect anyone to be perfect, but they want to know that you uh, have done your best and you tried. Uh, so if you have a risk assessment, you're probably better than most, uh, but, uh, but they really want to see that effort. And if they do see the effort, a lot of times you will see uh, the OCR investigators uh, close an investigation without a fine. And that's happened numerous times with DHS. In relation to the fines, there are some affirmative defenses. Uh, as long as the conduct wasn't willful and you corrected the issue within 30 days. So really critical that you do all that you can to uh, identify problems, correct the problems right away. Uh, and as long as someone didn't intentionally go out and try to, to steal information or do something, do harm to someone, you're probably going to be OK there. And also know that there's some authority for state attorney generals to enforce these provisions of HIPAA as they've been escalated over time. And the, uh, the Iowa Attorney General's Office uh, doesn't much focus on this because um, we, we don't have authority to investigate outside of kind of limited areas within the AG's office. Uh, their, their authority would be limited to <clears throat> writing a letter to an entity that uh, it thinks might have violated HIPAA. And uh, that's not really useful. The entity doesn't even have to respond. <clears throat> so most of the enforcement you see in Iowa is coming out of the federal government. There are a ton of good resources out there, uh, Deb and Carla included. But uh, if you look online uh, on the HHS website, hhs.gov, there's a frequently asked questions section uh, and the one for professionals is actually really good and fairly comprehensive. And you can just type in uh, keywords to try to identify various resources there. Uh, and a lot of times you can answer your own question just by looking online. And if not, there's always reaching out to Deb, Carla, or, or me uh, to hopefully get your questions answered that way. And that is kind of the basics of HIPAA 101, as I call it. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn you guys over to Deb and Carla and let them kind of cover where you going. Just checking for questions. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah, they may have questions for you, Brad. We can do questions at the end. Yeah. All right. But they're going to cover a little bit more of the basics of uh, what it is truly, what it truly means to comply with HIPAA from a large organization like DHS. Okay. Bob, Thanks, Brad. You're always a tough act to follow. This is Deb Covington, um, Information Security and Privacy Office with Iowa DHS. And I'm trying to turn the page here, and it's not turning. What did okay, you do to the mouse, Deb? Thank you. Um, just a high-level overview, DHS Information Security and Privacy Office, which we call, you'll hear the ISPO a lot. Um, 
We are responsible for protecting the confidentiality, integri integrity, and availability of citizens' data. And um, the old security, um, I guess, acronym CIA still works today with confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, we're responsible for ensuring that only those who have access, you know, ought, ought to see it, can have access. Integrity, that it can't, information cannot be modified without detection in systems. And availability, um, if, if a system is down or um, somebody has problems accessing a system, you know, that involves security as well. And just to give you a high level overview of what we do internally for DHS, as well as working very closely with our business partners, our business associates, um, we do risk assessments and work with all of our different business units on all DHS systems and applications that are developed. Um, one of the most important things to know is what data elements are involved in any system, any process. To understand the data elements, um, we have to understand the source of those data elements. Are they coming internally or from a specific federal entity? Because different state and federal security and privacy compliance uh, requirements um, are involved. Um, access control, uh, limited access, Brad touched on that earlier with minimum necessary need to know. And we have to make sure that appropriate IT and cybersecurity controls are implemented. Um, I mentioned the risk assessment earlier, but that is crucial. Um, the first thing we're asked in any kind of HIPAA um, investigation is show us your risk assessment. That's the very first question they ask on any breach um, and possibly, probably a lot of complaints as well. Um, we develop system security plans. Um, we make sure that security scans are ran by our IT group. Um, we monitor those results and make sure that any high and critical vulnerabilities that are identified are remediated immediately and just provide ongoing oversight and reviews. And I think it's important here to know, you know, DA, uh, information security and privacy is a shared responsibility. It should never be an afterthought. And it's not just your IT department or your whoever's in charge of security or privacy for your um, entity, no matter how large or small, um, a security wide um, culture has to be established. And that involves incident reporting, trainings, um, and also enforcing accountability. The, the second question HIPAA asks us when there's a HIPAA breach or complaint um, because somebody made a mistake or, um, you know, sent an email with protected health information to an incorrect person. Um, the second question they will ask is sanctions. You know, what did you do after that happened? Um, so that's also very important. Um, this slide just shows exactly what we do in our agency. And in talking with security, um, you know, that's the IT stuff. Um, you know, the antivirus, patching, website filtering, encryption, encryption, encryption. Um, we're working to encrypt uh, confidential data at rest now, which right now is not currently a federal requirement, but it will be. So we've already got a jump start on that and beginning to encrypt our data at rest. Password management, train your people on good passwords. Um, it's important to do system vulnerability and penetration testing. And what, if you have any kind of web application, it is if you're not doing web application scans, you need to either invest in an organization that will run scans for you or invest in a product such as HP's WebInspect where you can run the scans on a regular basis to make sure there are no higher critical vulnerabilities that would leave any holes um, so your web application could be possibly hacked. Um, they find a hole and they get into it and they can, cr they can cross over into different parts of your um, infrastructure into your network. And even if there's no PHI involved or 
data involved. They can do a lot of damage by just like publishing pornographic images on your website like they did for with the uh, Iowa Department of um, Public Safety and Iowa Homeland Security websites a few years ago. Um, Brad already touched on HIPAA privacy and what is PHI, so I'm not going to talk a lot about that. Um, but I do think it's important that you understand um, and can review the 18 different HIPAA PHI identifiers. And a lot of people think that, you know, protected health information is name and a diagnosis. It has to be something med related to something medical. And that is not necessarily the case. If um, a form goes out from DHS that has one of our members' names on it and their address and their birth date, and it also has their Medicaid ID number on there or something related to Iowa Medicaid, that is protected health information as well. And we have to send breach notification letters out if it went to an unauthorized person. And I'm gonna turn it over to Carla to talk about a few things. Switch. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. This is Carla Monroe, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about as being a business associate of DHS and, and, and actually of DHS too, kind of how we can take some of these the information that you've gained and apply it in the daily work. So one of the first things we talk about, the value of PHI, and I don't have the source on here, and depending upon which source you look at, we all know in the past that credit card information, bank account information was very valuable, but you know, anymore now they're saying up to 10 times or however many times, depending upon the source, that PHI can be much more valuable than bank account information. Uh, bank names, dates of birth, policy numbers, billing information can be used to create fake IDs. Drugs can be resold. Insurance claims um, can be submitted fraudulent, fraudulently to get money. People can access medical care under someone else's uh, protected health information. So really, it's, it is very valuable. And so people are always trying to get at, at your, your um, protected health information. So that's why HIPAA is so important. Now, you can see on this slide, I want to talk a little bit about risk assessments. And as a covered entity, DHS must perform these as a business associate. You must perform these on your information systems, your business processes. HIPAA requires it. It's one of the administrative safeguards that Deb and Barrett both previously mentioned. And at, in this cartoon I just have, in this wedding proposal, before I say yes, I'd like to carry out a risk assessment. So, of course, when somebody proposes to you, you're going to think through, you know, how things are currently going, what the risks are, what are the consequences, how tolerable is any risk. And so, really... The main purpose of a risk assessment is to make sure you cut the risk to consumers, most importantly, and to the organization. So risk assessments, this is just kind of some practical information. Are they a one-time task? No, they must be done on an ongoing basis. Technology threats are always changing. Your information system is changing. Your practices are changing. So as things change, you have to do your risk assessment, update your risk assessment. Sometimes people get confused. Well, if I've, I have a third party audit, do I have to also have a risk assessment? Yes, you must have a risk assessment. They're very important. An audit really is the discovery of what's already gone wrong. A risk assessment is what could go wrong and, and how do you mitigate the risk to people or to your organization. So for example, we're getting new laptops in. Well, you're going to need to do, should we encrypt? What encryption tool should we use? Yes, you should encrypt that. But it's not even a question. But what, what tool should you use? That kind of thing. So you always know you have new equipment. How can you protect it? And, and doing what it, what it takes to protect it ahead of time so that something happens, you, you're protected. You know, you don't have to pay somebody to do a risk assessment. You can do it yourself. On this slide, CMS, Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services, has a published a risk assessment, and we've got the link here. You can do it on your own agency. It's important, though, that you do do a risk assessment. Basically, you know, what's really important to know about confidential information, including PHI, in your organization is where is it? 
what is the format? Is it in print? Is it electronic? Who has access to the data? Is access control? Those are very first and foremost in things that you questions that you need to ask yourself. Do you have policies and procedures in place regarding access to PHI and how you handle PHI? Do you train your staff? Do you limit access only to the minimum necessary staff? You know, or only those staff authorized to access PHI that need it? Can you ensure that it's not being altered or destroyed by staff? And if, you know, do you have things in place that if there was some kind of alteration or destruction of PHI, is that identified in your system so that somebody's notified? Do you have technology in place to guard against unauthorized access so over electronic networks? So for example, is your email encrypted? That is so vital to, to make sure that email is encrypted. And one thing I will admit that I did not know until we really started working with encryption a couple years ago within our agency is that the subject line is never encrypted. You never want to put confidential information. It doesn't matter if it's Google, Microsoft, whatever, whatever um, email and service provider that you have subject line is not encrypted don't know the tech can't remember the technical reason for that but that's just the case is your email stored in the cloud if so do you have a business associate agreement with that cloud provider are your laptops encrypted dhs has had laptops stolen out of locked vehicles it can happen you know if it's encrypted you know, yeah, you're out the laptop, but the, 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 the thief doesn't have access to the information on that laptop. So these are all very important questions. Not an all-inclusive list of questions, but just an important set. Do you limit physical access to PHI to only authorized staff? Do you have policies and procedures in place to um, specify proper use and access to workstations? We're very mobile. Do you have, you know how people should handle their mobile devices, how they should handle electronic media. Do you allow removable media, such as a USB device? Are they encrypted? Do staff know to lock their computers when they leave the um, when they leave their desk? That kind of thing. So all of those things are very important to know. And as Deb said, we've been through investigations with Office for Civil Rights on breaches, and those are all the questions that they ask. Those are fundamental questions. Now, if you should have a breach or an incident, uh, I guess I'll talk about incidents really quickly first about um, you know, PHI, really it can be any number of things that can create an incident. And as a business associate, you're required to notify DHS or anybody you have a business associate relationship with of, you know, a suspected or known theft or loss of unauthorized access of PHI. Maybe it's an unauthorized access to data. It could be accidental. It doesn't have to be willful. It could be accidental. Did you have an unauthorized release of information, a lost device, laptop? Did you send an email to the wrong person? If it was encrypted... You know, you may be in luck there, but you may not be. It just depends on the situation. Did you mail or fax PHI to the wrong person? Did you, you know, were there unauthorized changes to a system made? And, and do you have those kind of those um, fail safes in place so that if that would happen, something gets triggered so, so the right people know that that's happened? Do you have people viewing confidential data without proper authorization? Brad gave the example, you know, of looking at Tom Cruise's medical information. Uh, you know, you didn't need that to do your job, but you did it anyway. That is an incident. Now, not every time something like this happens, do you have to notify people? You know, do you have to do breach notification under HIPAA, notifying people of the of what happened? When you do that, the incident becomes a breach. Not every incident is a breach, but you have to do a risk assessment to determine if you need to notify or not. But these are just examples. You know, DHS sees this a lot. A lot of times it's just somebody makes a mistake, but it's important to always know when that's going on. And so your staff know to report that and who to report it to so that you can get ahead of, you know, any impact to people. Really, that's just the most important thing. And then you can stop it from happening again. 
Um, we see a lot of data breaches, human error, accidental, you know, things get stuffed in the wrong envelope, emails get sent to the wrong person. That can really happen with auto populating of contact information on emails. It's just really super important when you're emailing and mailing things to make sure you're sending it to the right person. You know, inadvertent disclosure, you certainly don't want to have a training manual with actual real live data. You want to use very dummy down test information. You, you don't want to use screenshots from your system with actual data. That has happened. Deb mentioned putting information on public facing websites. You've got to be super careful about that. And then really, you know, not and, and having policies and procedures in place when you have paper PHI, you want to make sure if you have that, it's safeguarded, you know, in the car, as Brad said, locked in a trunk. You know, it's properly shredded, not just thrown in a box on the floor, that kind of thing. And you, and then that your your areas are always secure. So, you know, there's there's all sorts of things that can happen. And you just by doing a risk assessment, that's when you see where your PHI is, how it's being processed, how it's being handled, how it's being accessed. So that those procedures, policies and procedures and training are in place so people know how to handle it properly. It just kind of all comes full circle once you really do that risk assessment and look and see where your information is and who is using it and that kind of thing. Deb, go ahead. Okay. The last little bit. Switch. Okay, I'm going to buzz this through this very quickly because I want Brad to finish off. Um, but email phishing right now is the number one threat. It's the number one threat incoming emails, um, clicking on links, emails are very well crafted. Um, it appears to be from somebody you know. Um, there are some tricks, some tips that's in the second slide here on how to identify um, suspicious email, a phishing email, but this is what can actually put a business under. Um, ransomware starts with a phishing email. Um, it's happening all over um, states right now in particular with the election year. Um, it's happened in Texas, um, a couple other states, Colorado, and um, the state of Iowa in particular is constantly being um, pinged by um, other countries um, trying to get into our systems and all it starts with somebody clicking on a link from a phishing email. So I just added that slide in there to show you. But um, Carla talked about incident reporting already. DHS has a very, um, I would say, streamlined and robust incident reporting process that Every single business associate um, out there should also have and train your people on. And also regarding HHS OCR HIP and breach and complaint investigations, um, you can, you know, they are starting to investigate business associates also on breaches as well as complaints. Um, HIPAA, they do um, initiate breach investigations on everything over 500. I'm sure if you if you Google right now, Iowa DHS data breach, um, our most recent one will pop up from a couple weeks ago. We did a press release uh, regarding some paper uh, workers putting in a shred box underneath their desk instead of putting it in a secure bin every day. And New janitorial people took it, uh, put it in the dumpster that ended up in the dump. And because we don't uh, mark every single print job out there, we had to do um, notification of almost 5,000 people just based on each worker's caseload. Um, and that was a real, that was a 60 day um, arduous um effort for us and now we will be investigated by OCR. They contacted us already. They're going to kick that off. Um, Brad mentioned that DHS is always under some sort of investigation and it, it sounds worse than it is, but their investigations last two to three years. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we just completed one major one that involved a combination of four breaches and one complaint with zero fines and zero corrective actions. 
which was pretty good. That's saying that we're doing everything we need to do. Um, HHS OCR, every conference that we go to, Brad and Carla and I, via webinar, we never go on site, we attend via our conference room. One of the things they say every year we hear, a record year for fines, a record year for OCR HIPAA fines. So they're raking in a lot of money on fines. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, and I think we're going to end up with Brad talking about some actual fines. Musical chairs again? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, th I think out of all of this, the, the one thing that I failed to include in the slide deck here is um, the big change that occurred in 2013, dealing with individual notice. Uh, prior to 2013, there was no obligation under HIPAA or any of the other Iowa state laws uh, to provide people with individual notice when something bad happened with their healthcare information. And then all that changed with the 2013. And, and now the obligation is, uh, even if it was just an email sent to a wrong party with one patient's name in it or one patient's PHI in it, that patient is entitled to individualized notice and they have to get a letter uh, it basically laying out some parameters that are in the regulations saying, you know, what happened, what you did about it, uh, how you've corrected this problem. Uh, and as those, uh, as the, the number of people involved in a breach get bigger and bigger, uh, the obligations become bigger and bigger. So if you uh, exceed 500 people involved in a breach, then you have to notify the secretary of HHS immediately uh, uh, along with all of the patients and all of that notice, uh, all of these notices have to happen within 60 days of the date that you knew or that you should have known about the breach. So, uh, and, and what they say about that is you can't wait to the 59th day and send out letters to, to the patients involved. You have to send the letters as soon as you can, uh, but absolutely within 60 days. So uh, when you have a, a big problem, and we have dealt with this a few times, uh, it can be really difficult to meet that two month timeline. And so you want to make sure that you're doing everything possible to to avoid that. Uh, and, and what you see along the way is um, there, there's costs. There's costs of notifying people. If you're uh, if you're uh, if you let information get out that, that could be used to harm someone from a financial perspective, it's uh, HHS will tell you it's very, very wise and they would view it as part of your mitigation strategies to uh, provide uh, credit monitoring for those people. There's a cost to that. Um, if HHS steps in, they can impose tremendous fines against you for failure to comply. So that's a cost. And they also will generally impose on you as well, uh, and I forget what they call them, corporate integrity agreements or uh, basically a, an, an agreement that you have to continue to prove that you're meeting all of your obligations under HIPAA for a period going forward. And, and the cost of that compliance uh, can be, uh, well, can outweigh more everything else, fine. more than the fine. Yeah. So let's just look at a couple of examples of fines and there are hundreds of these out there you can go to hhs's website and and they'll give you a bunch but uh here's one related to a health plan from uh right after the obligations went in place in 2013 uh they they fined affinity health 1.2 million dollars uh, because it allowed a hard drive to not be uh, to, to be basically be discarded with a printer. Someone picked up the printer, found that it included 344,000 patient records on the hard drive in the in the printer, and uh, and once HHS found out about it, ultimately they received this fine of 1.2 million dollars. And I believe this was a 2013 fine, so this was under the old fine structure, not the new ones. So mm -hmm. the fine would be much larger today. Concerta Health uh, received a fine of $1.75 million, uh, and this related to a theft of an unencrypted laptop. And, and so, again, as we hear in the federal trainings that we receive, the, the three most important things you can do, do is encrypt, 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 make sure everything is uh, has a, a good encryption policy around it. Uh, and definitely all of your portable devices have to be encrypted. If they're not, then they, as soon as the first one gets lost with patient information on it, you've got a, a huge problem. Uh, 
I don't know how to get rid of that. Okay, there it goes. So encryption is key. And the last one uh, that I have here is uh, an interesting one where uh, New York Presbyterian Columbia University Hospital was fined almost $5 million. Uh, and what happened was one of the physicians developed this wonderful little app that uh, allowed uh, different, uh, different organizations involved in a patient care to, to get access to that patient care. Uh, great app, but it didn't have technical safeguards. And what happened is 6,800 people ultimately had their information posted on the internet. Uh, and so they find them about five million bucks. So, um, so again, uh, you know, what we're talking about in terms of these massive fines look terrible. Uh, the actual cost of compliance can just be leaps and bounds beyond this because of the other obligations that you have. Uh, and there were a couple of questions that came in, uh, and I think I can respond to these. I think somebody asked, uh, you know, could we connect this presentation to ECI's obligations, roughly? Uh, well, if you look back at the, the contracts that are in place today, there's an MOU between DHS and ECI State Board that makes the ECI State Board a business associate of DHS. And that's so that um, uh, patient-specific information can be passed back and forth between the two organizations. Uh, otherwise, it would be impermissible. And there's a separate MOU between ECI, Department of Education, DHS, uh, Department of Management, and the local boards. And, and again, there's a business associate uh, agreement in, in that agreement as well. So, uh, and, and that is because uh, my understanding is uh, under certainly in the fam family support scope of work, uh, there's going to be gathering of data, uh, on behalf of DHS in relation to the people served. Uh, and some of that data will expose people's substance abuse history, maybe their mental health. Uh, so, so again, uh, all of this would begin to implicate HIPAA because we're getting into personal health information that's being gathered or obtained or stored or accessed or used uh, on behalf of ultimately a covered entity of DHS. So kind of no way that any of us can avoid dealing with all of this stuff. So that, that does implicate all of, of HIPAA for anyone associated with any of those contractual obligations. And so everything that we spoke about today is going to apply to the state board, to the local boards, to subcontractors who are accessing that kind of information um, to the extent that they do access PHI. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? Raise a hand. Any more questions, Tammy? Yeah, I'm not seeing any right now. Well, any other questions, feel free to type them in or uh, uh, Deb, Carla, and I are certainly available for uh, follow up or uh, as you know any issues come up with uh, HIPAA compliance, feel free to reach out to us at any time. All right. Well, thank you, Deb, Carla, and Brad. And again, if you have additional questions, you can send those in to us. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much for your time.